All right, all right, all right. We are here to get a little intro to chemical equilibrium. So this is uh, your final unit for the year, TP Chem Unit 11. Um, so you may be wondering, what is this equilibrium you speak of? Um, and in the context of science, at least, um, it refers to when uh, there is no net change to the conditions of a system. And so a little diagram you see off to your left here uh, indicates uh, a system in which we have inputs, right, in the form of water and outputs of the same form, but those inputs and outputs are at an equal rate such that the volume of water inside this container uh, does not change. So yes, there's water going in, yes, there's going water out, but the rates are equal, so there's no net change in that system. And that's what equilibrium means. It doesn't mean things aren't ch changing and there aren't things going on. It just means that the system has developed a sort of steady state. Okay? Um, in the world of chemistry, to have a more specific definition within our context, it's uh, the point in a chemical reaction in which the rate of formation of products is equal to the rate of formation of reactants. Okay, uh, another way to say that, so slightly less of a mouthful, is to say when the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. And by forward reaction, we mean uh, the formation of products. And by reverse reaction, we mean the reformation of reactants. And so if we have, you know, A plus B equals AB, for example, so we have a synthesis reaction. Um, what that means, the forward reaction would be the formation of our products. So this is our forward reaction and our reverse reaction when we go back the other way. And most of the context in which we've talked about so far in terms of reactions and stoichiometry, um, we've been operating under this assumption that all of the, the reactants end up becoming products until you, until you run out of one or both of them. Um, and that, that does happen in some reactions, but a lot of reactions kind of end up stopping well before that point. So now if you take a look at our, our graphs off here to the left, all right, so uh, the first graph, the top one here, shows um, the rate. So notice our y-axis here is rate, okay, and the rate in this case uh, is referring to the rate at which products form, so that's our forward rate, and likewise it's also showing the rate at which um, reactants form, which is our reverse rate. Now, we reach equilibrium when both of those rates are equal. Okay, so the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate. Now, notice the forward reaction begins very quickly and slows down over time. Okay, um, whereas the reverse reaction rate starts at essentially zero and increases over time. Eventually, we get to a point where those two rates are equal. Now, what thing I want you to get in your heads as quickly as possible is that equilibrium does not mean equal concentration. Okay? Uh, so in this same reaction, we can show um, the reaction uh, uh, amounts of both reactants and products. So the amount could refer to, like, the molarity, for example. All right? So in this case... Our forward reaction rate shows the formation of uh, products, right? So in this case, the, the product's amount is increasing over time until it levels out. And in that process, because remember, what we have to understand is that these become the product, right? So if the product amount is increasing, that means that the reactant amount is decreasing. And that's indicated by this red line here. This point right here, beyond this point, that's our equilibrium, right? Notice that we have more products at equilibrium. They don't have an equal concentration. It's just that there is no longer a net change in the concentration once equilibrium is reached. Okay, so equilibrium does not e mean equal concentration. It means equal rates of formation of both reactants and products, we might end up with more reactant or we might end up with more product 
But as long as there's no net change in the amounts, we are at equilibrium. Okay, moving forward. Um, I'm going to make some analogies. So I'm going to draw some quick pictures. All right, so there's a scenario. We've got two buckets connected. All right, so this would be like my reactants and my products. Okay, so this would be A plus B over here and then AB here. All right, so in this scenario, we have our two buckets on equal ground. Another scenario, I'm going to draw my reactants up here and my products down here. A plus B and AB. This is my reactants and my products. Okay, and in another scenario, I'll draw my reactants down here. And my products up higher. All right, so, and this would be my reactants, products, A plus B, and this is my AB. Okay, now, uh, the reason I wanted to show you this particular analogy is it's going to help us visualize what it means to be at equilibrium, okay? Uh, and so in the first scenario here, where my buckets are equal, what would equilibrium in this scenario would also mean equal concentration. So what I want you to picture is the water level, right? Let's say I begin, okay, uh, with all reactant and no product, okay? If I open up a little valve immediately, right, water is going to rush from my reactants to my products, right? And we would then see an associated decrease in the amount of reactants and an increase in the amount of products. Eventually, we'd get to a point, right, where our water levels were equal, okay? So the level of the water and the reactant would be equal to the level of the water in the product side, okay? In that case, right, what would happen is the water would stop rushing into the product, okay, um, and we would see no net change in either container. We would also see that the amounts are equal, okay, so it would appear to us that there's actually no change going on. In reality, water molecules are moving, so there would still be an exchange of water from one side to the other. It's just that the water going into the reactant side would be equal to the amount of water going into the product side, and we would be at equilibrium. Also, so equal concentration, coincidentally. But as I stated on the last slide, equilibrium does not mean equal concentration necessarily. It could, depending on the reaction and the circumstance. Okay, now, if I run a reaction where uh, the forward reaction is favored, what would happen, again, we would end up having equal water levels in both containers, right? The level of water would be equal, but I would have more products, okay? So we reach this point where there's still some reactant, there's just a lot more product than reactant in this case, right? But again, the rate at which water moves in and out of both containers is constant at that point, once the water levels each reach that equilibrium, okay? But in that case, we have a lot more product and a lot less reactant, okay? Likewise, some reactants favor that reverse reaction, okay? So at equilibrium, we have more reactants, okay, and relatively few products. Okay, some reactions uh, carry out that way where there's only some amount of the, the total product form. But the key about understanding equilibrium is there is no net change. So the rate at which we move to products is equal to the rate at which we move to reactants, okay? But it does not necessarily mean equal concentration. It could just so happen that way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, okay? We could end up with an equal concentration. We could end up with more products. We could end up with more reactants at equilibrium. But once we're at equilibrium, there's no longer a net change. All right. 
moving forward, equilibrium constant. So uh, we're going to take this little uh, base reaction into play. And so equilibrium constant is a value, right, uh, listed as uh, KEQ here. All right, and the way we find that value is we take the molarity of our products, okay, um, and the little exponents are our coefficients, okay, divided by the molarity of our reactants. Okay, and again, those exponents would be our coefficients. It's a simple multiply, then divide, and that's going to give you our uh, equilibrium constant for a reaction. So when at equilibrium, the molarities would then tell you uh, what the equilibrium constant is. Okay, so in the case of the Haber process, in which we take uh, a nitrogen and hydrogen gas to make ammonia, part of the, uh, it's a simplified version of how we make fertilizer, by the way, all right? Um, in the Haber process, we take nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas, we react them to form ammonia, which is the key component of fertilizer, all right? So if I wanted to know how to calculate my equilibrium constant for the Haber process, I would write K EQ would be equal to, so I have the molarity of products is my numerator, so I'm going to go molarity of NH3. My coefficient is 2, so I'm going to raise that to the second power, over the molarity of nitrogen gas to the 1, okay, times the molarity of hydrogen gas to the third. All right, so if I knew molarity values for my reactants and my products at equilibrium, I would just plug those in, to my table, to my formula, and I would get a number for the equilibrium constant. All right. Uh, now, the equilibrium constant is a value that helps you understand whether uh, this reaction is going to favor formation of products or whether the reverse reaction is favored, in which case we end up with more reactant. And the way you tell once you know your value for K is if K is greater than 1, okay, that means the forward reaction is favored and we get more products. If K is less than 1, right, that means the reverse reaction is favored and we get more reactants. So if we were to look at this little uh, diagram down here, okay, um, so hydrogen and nitrogen are my reactants, okay. Which has a higher concentration at equilibrium? The product or my two reactants? Okay. In this case, so in the Haber process, at equilibrium, we end up with a higher concentration of my reactants. So we should be able to predict that in this case, K is less than 1. All right. Now, its exact value, we would need to know actual molarity values or concentrations um, for hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia. But we don't know that. We do know that at equilibrium, the reverse reaction is still favorable, which means we still end up with more reactants, which means that the value for our equilibrium constant should be less than 1. Okay? If you knew the actual molar values, you just plug those in, and you should get a value less than 1. How much less than 1 it is would be indicative of how much the reverse reaction is favored. All right? Um, I went a little longer than 10 minutes, but like I said, if you round to the nearest 10, still 10. Peace.